Niña, yo recuerdo la pena y el dolor Y este sentimiento de duda y de rencor Bella, ya tú sabes, me quiero redimir Tú tienes la llave que calma mi sufrir Y tú te vas, tú te vas French and the American, which irrevocably changed the political makeup of the modern world that we all live in today. The second major event is the revolution that began in 1910 and shaped so much of the modern history of Mexico. Over time, the revolution changed from a revolt against the established order to a multi-sided civil war. After prolonged struggles, the political constitution of the United Mexican States was approved by a Constitutional Congress on February 5, 1917. The revolution is generally considered to have lasted until 1920, although there is some debate about this. It was an enormously destructive revolution in that an estimated 900,000 people were estimated to have been killed. Yet millions of people fought for what they saw as social justice and freedom. In so doing, they made the first successful revolution of the 20th century. In, 20, in 2010, Mexico shares a number of commonalities with Australia. For example, both countries are federal systems, both countries have three levels of government, and at the federal level, both countries have two legislative chambers. 
Mexico and Australia are two of 17 countries that the World Conservation Monitoring Centre has identified as mega-diverse countries. Both countries have close relations with the United States and have free trade agreements with that country. Both countries were colonised. Both are ethnically diverse and predominantly Christian. Both are large countries in terms of land mass and interestingly, the Tropic of Cancer divides Mexico, while in the Southern Hemisphere, the Tropic of Capricorn divides Australia almost. And depending on whether you use the World Bank, the IMF, or the CIA, the two countries rank as either the 13th or the 14th largest economies in the world. At a more local level, Mexico City was a federal district until 1987, and interestingly, the Australian Capital Territory became self-governing in 1989. There are, of course, many noticeable differences. Mexico has over 120 million people, and it shares physical borders with three countries. Mexico City and its metropolitan area is the most densely populated in the world, with 21 million people, with almost the same number of people who live in the whole of the landmass of Australia. And, of course, poverty rates are noticeably higher in Mexico than Australia. And a very important fact is that we drive on the left, and in Mexico, <laughs> they drive on the right, which is a small indicator that our colonial masters, and hence our dominant languages, are very different. Mexico, from revolution to democracy, has been arranged by the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies. And in, in Canberra, we love acronyms, so it's called ANCLAS which I understand means anchor in Spanish. Uh, ANCLAS exists to develop research and teaching in Latin American studies, particularly in the fields of the social sciences, humanities, business and economics. It aims to promote mutual interest and exchange between Australian and Latin American scholars and to raise broader public awareness and understanding of Latin America in Australia. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the director of UNCLUS, Dr. John Means, who has done a truly remarkable job in building the profile of UNCLUS in just two short years. In the last year, he's organised nearly 40 public lectures and seminars and shown around 50 Latin American films. The film nights hosted by UNCLUS have proven rather popular amongst our undergraduate students. And we know that Latin America is now a very popular destination for young Australians. Over the last two years, UNCLOS has hosted four visiting scholars from Latin America, two of them partly supported by the Council of Australia-Latin American Relations. There is a notice board outside the venue this evening which demonstrates the variety and the con uh, quantity of the work being undertaken by UNCLOS, and I'd encourage you all to have a look on your way out. I'd also like to just take this opportunity to officially welcome you to the College of Arts and Social Sciences here at ANU. The college ranges from archaeology to politics and music to sociology. To say we are a diverse bunch would be an understatement, and I might add it's quite a challenge being a college dean. The college employs over 400 research and teaching staff and has close to 400 PhD students. It's made up of two research schools of social science and humanities and the arts, the Australian Demographic and Social Research Institute. And within those research schools, there are 12 discipline-specific schools which house a further 14 smaller centres. The ANU is, as a whole, a research-intensive university and 80% of the funding for ANU is spent on research activities. And this is actually reflected in the activity profiles of our staff, who recently uh, completed a survey on this, and 23% of the staff suggested they spent their time on teaching, while the remainder was spent on research, research training of our postgraduate students, and other activities associated with delivering an outstanding research and teaching environment. And of course, UNCLOS is a very important part of that. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the diplomatic community who are here tonight and those who are not <coughs> able to come, who provide ongoing support to UNCLOS. We do have extensive networks and cooperation with many of the diplomatic missions in Canberra. Different embassies provide scholarships, prizes, 
and fund academic positions across a wide range of areas, from languages to music and to our comparable centres on European and Arabic and Islamic studies. Your support enriches the lives of our students and provides unique opportunities for our scholars. This week's conference forms a key part of the college's outreach activities, which we hope will further develop and exchange research on Latin America in Australia and internationally. I hope that many of you who are here for the conference will renew old acquaintances and make new ones. I understand that there are many uh, postgraduate students and honours students, uh, and today that you've heard some very interesting and provocative papers. I hope that when you leave the conference, tired, you leave tired but stimulated, and by the end, you know something more than when you came. In amongst the heady discussions of revolution and democracy, I encourage you to find some time to enjoy the campus despite the frosty conditions. It would be remiss of me not to also thank the staff, students and friends of UNCLUS who have spent many months preparing for this event along with John. I know they've stuffed your satchels with goodies, tried to accommodate your demands, and have remained good humoured throughout. Although John did say to me on the corridor the other day, never again. <laughs> Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to officially welcome you all to the ANU and to open Mexico from revolution to democracy. Thank you very much, Professor Mackay. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to ask the Ambassador of Mexico, Her Excellency Mrs. Beatriz Lopez Gargallo, to speak and to introduce our guest speaker tonight. But first, I also want to uh, provide some thanks to people uh, for the organisation of this conference and these events because there's an enormous amount of work that goes on behind the scenes. Most of it, I must say, unpaid work behind the scenes. Uh, in the first place, I'd like to thank Professor Barry Carr. Uh, Barry has been really the, I suppose, patriarch of Latin American studies in Australia for a very long time, the foundation, really, of Latin American studies or the Trojan University, probably the most important center uh, for a very long period of Latin American studies in Australia. And I'm happy to say that uh, we've snappled him as an adjunct professor here now at the ANU as well. And it was originally Barry's idea to hold this conference two conferences in the same week, uh, and that was nevertheless has turned out while uh, wearing to be an excellent idea because an opportunity too good to be passed up, really to celebrate both, uh, to, to remember both the bicentenary of independence for a number of Latin American countries and the centenary of the Mexican Revolution. And it's as much Barry's reputation as a scholar internationally as well as his organisational work in the conference that's made a success, it a success. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank the Embassy of Mexico and the Ambassador of Mexico, uh, Mrs. Um, Beatriz Lopez Gargallo, and for her support for the conference. Again, uh, without the support of the Embassy, it would not be possible to have a guest speaker here tonight, here, and many other things uh, associated with the conference. And also, uh, I should mention Arturo Delgado. Uh, it seems that I speak to Arturo at least every day now in my working life in organising one of many things, not only this conference, but film showing and many, many other things, and he's been a great support. Uh, I'd also uh, like to return thanks to Professor Mackay, the Dean of this college, my college, and the college within which, which Anklos exists, the notice boards outside, which are uh, a shameless job of self-promotion uh, of Anklos, detailing some of the things that we've done over the last couple of years certainly wouldn't have been possible without the support of the college, and Anklos wouldn't exist at all uh, without the support of the college. The Australian International Hotel School uh, is perhaps not something that's normally associated with Latin American studies, but in the course of film showings that we did, we discovered that there were a number of Mexican students here in Canberra studying at the Australian International Hotel School, and that they, as you might expect, were quite good cooks. And so the uh, food that you'll be eating afterwards in the reception after this lecture will have been prepared by them with the support of the hotel is still in its staff and its infrastructure. But also, there's very, very important student support uh, that's gone on. Most of the work really has been done in an unpaid or a virtually unpaid manner to organise all of these events. And I just have to mention a number of people, uh, particularly in regard to that. Firstly, Petra Wilson-Jones, 
who's been working on this conference, both conferences, for months and months, uh, dealing with emails and requests and sometimes demands, and uh, usually happiness, but not always. And without all of that work over months, uh, well, I think she's done just enough to just about keep me sane, but uh, we'll come back to that at the end of the week. Uh, Guy Anderson, who's got a brilliant career in academia, uh, here in doing his PhD, but we have a brilliant career as a graphic artist as well, and many of the posters that you see, for example, are designed by him, and also Ben Bronner, who's uh, uh, designed these wonderful banners uh, that you see here, and many other things, and many other elements of the web. If you look at the Ankles web, we're very proud of it. The website works very well, and requires an enormous amount of input from Ben, and also Jesse Moritz. Uh, who works consistently on that, and has also turned herself into something of a film director. Uh, the keynote speeches uh, will all be in this conference, videotaped and be available on the web. In fact, we're breaking new ground in all sorts of ways here. All of the audio presentations will be available on the web, and all of the keynote speeches will be available in video on the web, hopefully within a couple of weeks. Uh, also, Anthea Jones, who's turned briefly from the final editing of the PhD thesis to become the accommodations are for guests and uh, to do the meet and greet at airports and so on. And other people like Tom Chodor, who's been a general go for around the place and so on. To all of these people, uh, I thank you very, very much for making this a success. The success has been to date. And I'd like to now introduce finally the Ambassador of Mexico. Thank you. I'm always uh, shocked. <laughs> uh, good evening, excellencies and distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is uh, really a great honor for me to welcome all of you to this very special event organized by the Embassy of Mexico in collaboration with the Australian National Center for Latin American Studies of the Australian National University in order to present to you Dr. Javier Garcia Diego, President of El Colegio de Mexico and certainly the most prestigious historian on the Mexican Revolution. Statistically, there were just a few historians until very recent times that studied Mexican Revolution because it was thought that it was a very recent process. Most of them were politologists and sociologists. Nowadays, more professional historians, historians are interested in Mexican Revolution. So it is a great honor for me to uh, welcome you for this event, particularly uh, this 2010 in which Mexico celebrates its centennial of the revolution, of the Mexican Revolution. I believe, undoubtedly, this is the perfect time to reflect on it, on this 2010 commemorating our history. I feel very honored on this occasion to welcome Dr. Javier Garcia Diego to this recent, a prominent Mexican historian and researcher. Let me tell you who is Dr. Garcia Diego. Uh, so you get all this information. He holds a BA in political science from the National Autonomous University of Mexico City, MA, MA in Latin American History at the University of Chicago, and a PhD in History of Mexico at the Colegio de Mexico, COMEX, and a PhD in Latin American History at the University of Chicago. Dr. Garcia Diego has been a researcher and lecturer at the UNAM, that's the National University of Mexico City, the Technological and Superior Studies Institute of Monterrey and Colmex. Also, as a visiting professor, he has taught and offered multiple lectures at numerous universities in the USA, in the European Union, South and South America, and the Caribbean. He's a distinguished member of the Mexican Academy of History since 2008 and a recipient of La Cruz de la Orden de Isabel la Católica, the Great Cross of the Order of Queen Elizabeth the Catholic, granted by His Majesty and the Government of Spain in 2005. 
He has written numerous books, as John said before, The Mexican Revolution, eight volumes, Eminent for Feministas in 1986, Historical Introduction to the Mexican Revolution in 2006, among others. Finally, I want to express our gratitude to Dr. John Means and his collaborators for putting together, uh, along with our personal and all the, the, the persons involved, especially the students too, for their support provided for this event, also to Professor Barney Carr. After Dr. Garcia Diego's uh, conference, they will a cocktail served in his honor. There will be tequila and Mexican beer. So you are also welcome to stay. Thank you. Buenas noches. Don't you worry, I will speak in English. <laughs> well, first of all, um, I want to give my deepest thanks to the Mexican Embassy, Embajadora, Doña Beatriz López Gargallo, to my colleagues, Professor John Means, Dean Mackay, and to my friend, Barry Carr, who I suppose he gave my name some months ago. I'm really excited about this with so many people. First, I have to apologize because of my English. I learned it some years ago, but it's rusted, and my accent is not that good. But I'm sure you will uh, understand, and at least I'll do my best. Mexico's political evolution throughout the 20th century is the name of the, of the talk. This year, Mexico celebrates the 100th anniversary of the 1910 revolution. The year 1910, marking the outbreak of the Mexican Revolution, should be considered the real and authentic start of the 20th century in Mexico, rather than 1900, which is no more than a formal beginning according to the calendar. The state, the state which had predominated up to that time could hardly be viewed as modern, Strictly speaking, the liberal Mexican state has just, has just emerged in the latter decades of the 19th century, but it was both vulnerable and short-lived. Mexico was an oligarchic nation headed by a small number of landowners with an incipient middle class and a large popular sector in rural areas, and in economic matters was highly dependent on other countries. In political terms, an authoritarian regime prevailed, dominated from the top by Porfirio Diaz, with regional and local ramifications in the person of governors and political bosses. As regards ideology, Mexico was a monolith monolithically Catholic nation, while in terms of diplomacy, it would appear that its only desire was to prove to more powerful nations that it now could be trusted as a country, and that in Mexico, the Bellicos liberal mestizos who had triumphed in the mid 19th century had since been supplanted during the Porfiriato by a group of positivist Creoles who admired foreign ways. Due to the revolutionary process, by 1920, Mexico had become a different country where most of the power came to be held by a middle class that was victorious after having obtained military and political leadership during the armed struggle. In order to secure its triumph, the middle class found it necessary to enter into far-reaching alliances with local classes groups, be they comprised of peasants or workers, acknowledging their historical importance, something that was unimaginable 
10 years previous. And so, understandably, the nature of the post-revolutionary Mexican state was appreciably distinct. Even though at the close of the revolution, the Mexican state had new legislation, the Constitution of 1917, and a new socio-political structure, the country's situation was nonetheless quite dramatic. It was in dire need of economic recovery. The task of ensuring national cohesion after the armed struggle was as difficult as it was unpostponable. Peace, which has just been secured, was very fragile and was still interrupted a couple of times. Remember the failed rebellion led by Adolfo de la Huerta in 1923 against President Alvaro Obregón, as well as the Cristero War at the end of the 20s. And lastly, the, the monopoly of power in the hands of the victorious military men was an obstacle to the nation's political modernization. Even so, unlike Mexico under Porfirio Diaz, <coughs> during the revolution, the country acquired a new identity, a distinct personality. It came to be both progressive and nationalist. So then the challenge was to gain international respectability without sacrificing those new distinguishing features and function as an orderly country without losing its innovative spirit. From caudillos and militarism to institutions. During the first decade after the revolution, the country was dominated by a great caudillo, Álvaro Obregón, and power was distrib distributed vertically and horizontally among an increasingly smaller number of military men. The latter were convinced that the call to arms had been the means for attaining their long for social ascent, and that violence was the best way to resolve political conflicts. Obregón was well aware of the dilemma posed by that situation. Reduction and institutionalization of the Revolutionary Army was urgently needed as the only means for reorganizing Mexico's economy and civilizing its political battles. Yet, the danger involved was great, because an excessive decrease in military forces or the imposition of the exaggerated discipline might lead to an e uprising. <clears throat> the situation was extremely complex, for Mexico lacked a political grouping comparable to the revolutionary army that could serve as a counterweight. Certainly, once peace had been conquered, it was up to civilians to perform a more relevant, now reconstructive rather than destructive function in this new context. And while the oppositionist challenges of Adolfo de la Huerta and José Vasconcelos in 1923 and 1929 respectively were unable to displace the military sector, they should nevertheless be seen in that line. Their defeats indicated that the, arrivals of, that the arrival of civilian groups to national power was yet to appear on the horizon. The death of Obregón in mid-1928 not only left the country without its caudillo, but produced a new split between the ruling elite and the army, with the consequent rebellion of the latter because power had not been passed down directly to any of Obregón's most important followers. But thanks to President Lutero Yascalle's political acumen, it was possible to ensure that a civilian acceptable to Obregón's supporters assumed the post of provisional president. Moreover, Calle called for the creation of a partisan organization to resolve chronic conflicts the country had been experiencing over the appointment of candidates to popularly elected posts who were virtual winners in the absence of any sort of organized opposition. The main conflicts had to precede the election, so it was obvious there was a need to establish a party which would distribute segments of power among its members by assigning candidatures and which would be also enforced enough discipline for its decisions to be respected and obeyed.
This institution was the Partido Nacional Revolucionario, or PNR, namely the National Revolutionary Party, which came into being in March 1929. This didn't only mean that Mexico was finally shifting away from a period of caudillos to that of, to that of institutions, but rather that the military were beginning to be defeated by a civilian politicians. By civilian politicians. To that, to that end, the profound military reform of 1927, the signing of peace with the Cristeros, and the speedy defeat of the last rebellion led by a general, all contributed, all contributed, a sign of the times, while the, while the principal military figures were disappearing or declining, the new victors would be civilians, with Calles, President Calles, as the head as the Jefe Mexico or Supreme Leader. And so, military might was no longer the greatest asset. <coughs> now, that distinction would be held by an, ability, by an ability for political maneuvering and the weight of the social groups supporting their respective leader. Although Calles had promised that the country would come to be one ruled by institutions, paradoxically, he created a new brand of regime led by Caudillo. However, it was different from the previous one, in that it was more dependent upon its supremacy over political leaders, groups, and cadres than over the military. The period from 1929 to 1935 is known as the Maximato. During that time, the country had to put up with a diarchy whereby the constitutional president, be he Emilio Cortes Gil, Pascual Ortiz Rubio, or Abelardo Rodriguez, was obliged to share the power with Calles, the Jefe Maxim. Equally surprising was that, despite having been decisive in solving the crisis in 1928 and modernizing national politics, this new party was ephemeral and, in fact, soon became anachronistic. Be that as it may, we should not overlook both its merits and attainments. Obviously, the aim was not to fight for democracy, but rather to manage power. The creation of a political party uniting all the revolutionaries was an aspiration held by the anti-militarists for quite some time. However, due to the, to the preeminence of the revolutionary army, it had turned out to be not only unnecessary, but risky. Until that time, triumphs in politics had been achieved on the battlefield rather than through political conquest. In late 1928 and early 29, the right conditions finally came into place when the status of the military was weakened and simultaneously numerous groups of civil revolutionary politicians were consolidated. But clearly, the unforeseen eventually of Obregón's assassination also play an important part in this process. So the power vacuum resulting from that event was filled by the National Revolutionary Party and the Maximato, both of which were devised and created by Calles and his main collaborators. The National Revolutionary Party was neither sector or class based nor was its social representativeness restricted or limited. In contrast, the PNR was a confederation of numerous associations and local and state parties that held onto a considerable degree of regional autonomy in exchange for accepting the discipline imposed by the superior army. The advantage was that its candidates gained strength regionally because they belonged to a, national, to a nationwide monolithic organization which not only served as the arena for choosing a presidential candidate, but also for selecting candidates, state governors, and the other high positions. Moreover, this provided a solution for two of the greatest problems affecting Mexico during the period, achieving a more workable relationship between the president of the country and the state governors, as well as between the former and the legislative branch. Consequently, 
This fostered the country's integration, diminishing the centrifugal disorder characterizing it. And yet, both centralism and, and the predominance of the nation's executive branch, known as presidentialism, were also favored. While we cannot deny that the National Revolutionary Party was instrumental in the evolution of both of these distortions, that is, centralism and presidentialism, we also know that it played a key role in building the unpostponable political governmental apparatus, both vertically and horizontally. <coughs> Unlike the Porfiriato, when the relationship, the, relationship, the relationship between the central power and the regions was determined by Diaz's particular report or lack of it with a governor, and also like the revolutionary period, when they depended on the military strength of each region's respective cabillo, now the crucial, the crucial factor would be the, the extent of assimilation and discipline with regard to the national revolutionary party. And while some opposed Calle's centralizing process, a vast majority of the veterans of the Mexican Revolution benefit from it. The masses coming to the scene but also the president. The, existen the existence of the National, Revolution National Revolutionary Party was most useful for solving the serious problems of selecting candidates for popular elected posts. The decision involving a choice of candidates implied granting the party full power since its candidates won the elections due to the absence of opposing institutions. Thus, from its very inception, and for several years thereafter, the PNR was not an electoral, electoral machine, but rather an institution conducting complex political arbitrations, conceding power to some while disagreeing <coughs> others. It also helped accelerate the process of national integration because it was the first nationwide political organization, and also because it saw to it that the country's main caudillos and regional heads requested and obeyed the decision, the decisions reached by the superior, the supreme army. In return, their command over their spaces, areas, and contexts was both guaranteed and confirmed. Nevertheless, in another sense, the National Revolutionary Party soon became anachronistic. In the beginning, it had upheld Calles' economic ideology, support for the country's industrialization, for technification of agriculture, and for medium-sized landowners, as well as adherence to orthodox financial principles. Its radical stance were limited to nationalism and anti-clericalism, and to advocating socialist education, thus confirming their estrangement from liberalism. Its major limitation was that a few short months after its inception, in late 1929, the world witnessed the outbreak of its most acute economic crisis during, during the entire century. The consequences of the Great Crash in Mexico were immediate and devastating. Imports became more expensive, while a sharp drop in exports affected the productive sector prompting severe socio-political reactions among workers and peasants. Since both workers and, pencil, and peasants as social sectors were not included in the National, in the National Revolutionary Party, their mobilizations represented a threat to the government and to the prevailing political order. Understandably, an urgent need soon arose to organize them as auxiliary forces before their independent status became so strong, they would turn into a source of ungovernability. As of late 1933, in a climate of economic crisis and social unrest, another presidential succession had to be dealt with. The National Revolutionary Party chose as its candidate Lázaro Cárdenas, an experienced young man with a broad, 
with a broad, solid background, member of the group supporting Cadiz, but also with links to rising agrarian movements. At the beginning of his, of his presidency, he sought the backing of the Jefe Maximo and Great Electro, but soon, but soon did everything in his power to secure support from regional leaders and peasant and worker masses. Nevertheless, Cardenas confrontation with Cadiz during the second half of 1935 and early 1936 was not merely political parricide, nor was it a simple struggle between the two for power. What, what actually set them apart from one another was the concept of government. Whereas Cadiz felt that government should mediate conflicts and institu institutionalize all spheres of national life, Cardenas believed that its main obligation was to foster social equality. Cadiz was striving for a totally organized nation, while Cardenas wanted to ensure justice. And whereas Cadiz favored a modern country, Cardenas preferred a popular one faithful to its most ancient customs and traits. Politically defeated because they failed to take into account Mexico's new social historical condition, Cadiz and his closest circle and his closest circle were forced to leave the country in exile. Gradually, the entire pro Cadiz machinery was replaced. Leaders of peasant and worker associations who had been restrained and confronting during the Maximato period then became leading actors on the new national scene. As in all post-revolutionary processes, the notion of a virtually unique, exclusive party was maintained. But then, in 1938, a decision was made to transform the National Revolutionary <coughs> Party into the Party of the Mexican Revolution, or PRM, shifting from a federation of local parties and groups headed basically by Procadis politicians into a party comprised of four major social sectors, the military on the one hand, and politicians and civil servants on the other, both of which had had a majority and had been domin dominant until that time. And now, the recently included, pes included peasants and workers who for some time to come would be the principal actors in this new political apparatus. Furthermore, the support of rural and urban masses was useful to Cardenas as a counterweight to longtime politician and the national army. What he was not to complete, what he was not to completely dispense with the army, he would face his enemies rather with the power he obtained from the backing of workers and peasants. In addition, Cardenas had his own recital and the Obregón and Anticais collaborators, and people who advocated radically re reorienting the process of national reconstruction but by reactivating the revolutionary spirit. <coughs> that transformation was fundamental. Mexico was no longer a nation plagued by chronic rebellions, but rather a revolutionary one willing to carry out agrarian reforms and support workers in their struggles against businessmen with a strong enough identity to challenge the major powers, be it by nationalizing oil or by supporting the Spanish Republican government. With that transformation, on the other hand, Mexico under Lázaro Cárdenas came to adapt to the socio-historical social situation characterizing the international scene. For those were times of corporate political parties, rising masses, and welfare states. Another major accomplishment was the demise of the diary. In effect, with Cárdenas, presidentialism saw the light. At the time, it was deemed to be a positive development, albeit nowadays this tradition <laughs> has been questioned. Of course, a heavy maximum could not continue to wield real power in a truly institutionalized political system. 
Cárdenas triumphed because it was more acceptable for the president himself to be the nation's arbiter with the legal powers at his disposal. Thus, we can explain the confrontation between Cárdenas and Calles. They couldn't coexist, and two was one too many. For a jefe máximo could only reign as opposed to an underling president, but never in contrast with a legitimate one. President Cárdenas ended up as the big boss of the party, the country's major military figure, and the paternalistic leader of worker and peasant masses. Ironically, despite being the focal point of such powers, he was unable to ensure the success of his plan for Mexico. The rise of the middle class, institutionalization and progress. Although Lázaro Cárdenas had become a mythical character, a civil saint of Mexican history, at the end of his term of office as president, the country was seriously divided, a fact we cannot deny. While his policies had enjoyed unconditional support from both workers and peasants, at the same time, they were rejected by a large part of the middle and upper classes who, anxious about their uncertain future, sought to organize together in political or social institutions, such as the National Action Party, PAN, now in power, created in 1939. And so, with all of this as a backdrop, a new stage of our national history began. The establishment of the National Action Party and the National Synarchist Union, which was founded in 1937, as well as the 1940 presidential election, clearly revealed the polarization plaguing in Mexico as a result of the most radical and anti-clerical policies of Cárdenas and the party of the Mexican Revolution. The PAN arose as a party representing the urban middle class. In ideological, ideological terms, it was moderate, harbored democratic aspirations, and opposed Cárdenas' radicalism and the PRA corporatism. Above all, it was against a state totalitarianism in the realm of education. Yet, it couldn't be considered it couldn't, it couldn't be considered a businessman or a Catholic party because during, the, during its first years, it was mainly comprised of middle-class citizens and advocated lazy people. But the PAN only attracted the attention and interest, and interest of the traditional sector of the middle class and not the majority of its members who had progressed thanks to the political stability and economic growth achieved with the post-revolutionary Mexican state. That explains its weakness, its weakness in elections during its first 50 years in existence. Sometime later, sometime later the middle class was to become the country's most powerful social sector, politically speaking, taking into account that it had been marginalized during the era of Cárdenas' populist state, its gradual growth until it predominated the governmental apparatus implied a major historical transformation. Mexico's his to be an impatient, impatiently nationalist country subject to constant revolutionary effervescence and became an alified in its, in its international relations bringing to an end the isolation it had suffered from the rest of the world since 1938. Moreover, it turned politically moderate with a consequent reduction in serious social conflicts for the majority trade of mid-20th century Mexico was national union. And lastly, it enjoyed continuous economic growth and in demographic terms became urban also not yet cosmopolitan. Instead of a situation in which middle class interests were served by an oppositionist party, Manuel Avila Camacho's government set out to conquer the middle class, a feat achieved in early 1943 with the creation of the National Confederation of Popular Organization, La CNP. Of course, in order to seduce it, 
The moderate policies implemented by Avila Camacho were essential. The end of the Mexican Revolution, Revolution's reformist period and the country's incipient but uninterrupted economic progress kept most of the members of the middle class from being drawn in by the ban. Equally significant was mutual tolerance with the Catholic Church, which was achieved with, through the suppression of socialist education. Also important was the fact that the workers and peasants didn't terminate their, their alliance with the government after the latter had taken another path. That was accomplished by replacing their leader political role with economic benefits and adequate social protection. Thus, even in the absence of a full party system, after 1940, Mexico came to be a remarkable state in political terms. The government was, the government was characterized by its legitimacy, representativeness, and ability to obtain consensus. It was both inclusive and efficient. Miracle, growth and stability. In 1945, the Western democracies triumph in World War II and the Cold War commenced. Naturally, for geographical reasons, Mexico adapted its domestic situation to the circumstances abroad, aligning itself with the capitalist countries. As a result, there were two critical changes. For one, the PRM, Partido de la Revolución Mexicana, was transformed into the Institutional Revolutionary Party, or PRI, marking the close of revolutionary transformation and the beginning of moderation and institutionalization. For another, the Mexican Revolution's military veterans were cast aside, and for the first time, the country come to have, as, a, as its president, not only a civilian, but also a professional, namely Miguel Alemán. Contemporaneous with the birth of the pre PRI, Alemán's administration was marked by a new ideological discourse and the, country, and the country's changing nature. Mexico had ceased to be a nation of revolutionary stances. Similarly, it was shifting from a rural to an industrializing country with no major social conflict, in so much as the workers' demands were being met owing to real economic and social benefits attained, and to the fact that unions had pro-government non-radical leaders. The same was true of the peasants, because the rural milieu was dominated by caciques in permanent collusion with government officials, the solutions to their immediate needs were subsidies and national and international migration. And for many rural inhabitants, the promise of the reparto agrario or distribution of our cultural land constituted an effective instrument of political control. To be consistent with its new political position and international standing, which had moved away, had moved away from corporatism and Cardenas' brand of nationalism, the country had to improve its level of democracy. First of all, it made progress in building a full party system when in 1948, Vicente Lombardo Toledano, a former cardenista, created the Partido Popular or Popular Party, which, as it turns out, attracted more intellectuals than workers and more teachers than intellectuals. In this range of ideologies, the PRI was able to take a comfortable position in the center. Since the PAN was on the right, the PRI and Alemán's administration, as was also true later of that of Adolfo Ruiz Cortines, were not stigmatized for their notable ideological shift. It was argued that all they were doing was to move slowly towards the center. Moreover, the creation of the Partido Popular enabled them to keep some workers and also teachers from engaging in any alternative involving authentic radical opposition, oppositionists. Thus, 
it was possible to avoid criticism and opposition that would represent a real threat. For the Partido Popular usually attacked the bank rather than the government. And that allowed both the government and its party, the PRI, to evolve virtually intact during the following 20 years. Yet we have to accept that the PRI's successes during that period were not only attributable to astute political maneuvering, the economic benefits read or spawn any incentive for voters, voters to choose oppositionist parties, which were practically bereft of electoral victories because they lacked cadres and numerically significant memberships and sympathizers. Undoubtedly, Mexico was in good health in economic terms, while politically it enjoyed great stability. However, that period was not destined to last very long. Looming on the horizon was a crisis which, far from being a, spe a, a, a spectre, soon appeared cruel reality and all. The crisis. By the mid-20th century, the achievements made by Mexico were so remarkable that the crisis the country began to undergo in the second half of the 1960s were all that more painful because they came as a great shock. Even though previously the first major socio-political claims had already been put forth by both railroad workers and teachers. And to top it off, the crisis affected all spheres of life, and the origins and preliminaries were varied. Some had been sprouting up for years, while others broke out abruptly. In any event, all had been virtually imperceptible. On the one hand, the prevailing economic model, termed stabilizing development, had produced market differences in, inco in income distribution and cutbacks in public spending, which diminished the welfare nature of the Mexican state. Sectors such as public health and higher education soon suffered the negative effects of those budgetary cuts, which should be seen as fundamental antecedents of the demands posed by medical staff in 1964 and 1965 and the 1966 and 1968 student, student movements in Morelia, in Morelia, in the state of Michoacán, and in Mexico City, respectively, all of which were middle class phenomena. Gustavo Díaz Ordaz, who served as president of Mexico from 1964 to 1970, was reluctant to modify that economic model. Expanding social spending or improving income distribution would require, would require profound tax and wage reforms that were unacceptable to economic policy makers. They feared that this would inevitably lead to a reduction in investment, investment and to inflationary processes. In the political sphere, the crisis was just as severe. The increasing anger of the middle classes, previously faithful supporters of the regime, gave rise to their first opposition movements. In contrast, what the government lacked was a will for self-reform. And so what changes there were came from other political organizations. In addition, the success of the Cuban Revolution and the appearance of a new Mexican left, left, which had its roots in the universities and eventually displaced the now Partido Popular Socialista of Lombardo Toledano, allowed for radical critiques of Mexico's political system. Some even went, went so far as to propose alternate models and violent transformation. Yes, for that in his typical authoritarian style, resorted to repression as the only way to face these challenges. With this, a shortcoming of the Mexican government became evident. For the first time in many years, it found itself totally unable to negotiate and co-opt. To regain its 
effectiveness, the country's political system needed to undertake profound reform, reforms. Thus, Luis Echeverria, the succeeding president, who was aware of this dilemma, proposed economic, political, social, and cultural changes. Regarding economic matters, he substituted the model of stabilizing development for that of sure, sure development. The intention was to ensure that the middle and lower classes would no longer have to suffer all the sacrifices. Therefore, improved wages and tax reform were proposed, although it was unfavorable to business. There was also a proposal for greater, social, for, for greater social spending to benefit the lower income sectors with the government directing the national economy. An attempt was made to quell the rush, the rage of the middle, the rage of the middle classes for an opening towards democracy. The government initiated measures for, for self-criticism and society was allowed a certain degree of dialogue with it, so long as it didn't question the official trajectory. Social spending, especially in education and culture, increased noticeably. And unlike the recent repressions of student movements, youth were afforded political choices and facilities, whereas intellectuals were offered friendship instead of hate and scorn. Despite this, the crisis plaguing the country at the close of Echeverria's administration was just as serious as the one characterizing the early years of his term in office. Mexico was split, a situation it had not experienced since the end of Cárdenas' administration. Businessmen were confronting the government as well as workers and peasants, and the middle class was again anxious in the face of the country's first evaluation in 30 years and galloping inflation resulting from an expansion, expansion of public spending. The socioeconomic benefits enjoyed by the middle classes and workers had been short-lived and insufficient, while the proposal for a political opening, for, 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 for a political opening up turned out to be fictitious. All in all, the main problem was uncertainty, for the nation was lacking, was lacking reliable and responsible leadership. Besides, in countries where institutions are frail and democratic traditions recent, the only solution to the, problem, to the problems is usually to resort to the charisma of their leaders. But the outcome is counterproductive. The leader who was thought to be a miracle ends up leaving the country in need of major surgery. During the second half of the 1970s, Mexico underwent another of its recurrent cycle of optimism. At the time, a program was proposed to reactivate the economy through oil, whose high, high prices would make it possible to keep public spending at a generous level. On the other hand, a political reform was suggested so that instead of excluding various political organizations and governments, this would be legally recognized and in addition, the powers and representativeness of the, the, the legislative branch would be enhanced. At first, this program met with several successes based on oil exports, which enabled the government ac access to solid financial resources. However, <coughs> shortly afterwards, it became clear that sound permanent permanent economic growth and true democratic life were incompatible with the size of the Mexican governmental apparatus and its unmeasurable presidentialism. At the end of that decade, the crisis involving the government's legitimacy was virtually, virtually irreparable. Whereas it was unanimously acknowledged that the country was experiencing, experiencing a deep crisis, there was no consensus regarding the nature of that crisis or its causes and possible solutions. <coughs> there were radically opposed stands. 
for some, the crisis dated back to the end of the 70s when the model of revolutionary nationalism had run its course. In the view of others, it had emerged during the years immediately been following that decade when that model has ceased to be applied. The dilemma was clear, continuity or a change of course. During the 1980s, the government elite, supported by businessmen, decided that in the light of the new world complex and domestic financial constraints, the state apparatus should be reduced and the economy modernized. Those modifications began to be carried out timidly at first, but soon the re revisionist spirit gained force. As was to be expected, expected those changes took a high political toll as evidenced by the division of the ruling party and the 1988 election. The slimming of the government apparatus led to unemployment for a considerable number of politicians and public officials and employees who, causing those changes, joined leftist groups that were legally recognized but which lacked organization as a party as well as electoral and governmental experience. That unification led to the creation of a strong political institution, the Party of the Democratic Revolution, or PRD, a force that can also be explained by the enormous, enormous number of Mexicans suffering from financial difficulties during that period, and by the fact that the dominant, dominant political culture was revolutionary nationalism, nationalism, which was upheld by the PRD. The National Action Party, or PAN, also grew appreciably because the middle class, now discontent with the government due to persistent economic crisis, chose to join the ranks of the opposition first, thank you, first at the regional level and later with national aspirations. <coughs> All the same, the real transformation had taken place in the countries socio-demographic socio -demographic profile with the growth of middle and urban sectors and a great increase on young population. Obviously, these changes brought with them others in the people's political values. The redefinition of political and social positions and behavior was so great that immediately and unquestionably party preferences shifted to such a degree that we can safely say that between the 1988 and 2000 elections, there was a genuine watershed in our history. Twilight and dawn. Historiographically speaking, the term watershed is an exaggerated and therefore erroneous concept that fails to take into account the normal, for, the normal course of permanent historical change. So let's stick with the concept of historical change. <coughs> Some of these are decisive, such as the Mexican Revolution from 1910 to 1920, and the solving of the 1929 financial crisis. Also decisive was the Cardenas administration, as well as its conclusion, which involved the beginning of a new period in our national history. And the year 1968 was unquestionable decisive, forming a hint <coughs> between the end of the miracle and the onset of Paris crisis, but also a turning point between authoritarianism and democratization. Without a doubt, another major change occurred in the late, in the late 1980s and during the 90s. That change was not attributable merely to the appearance of competitive elections, but rather was much more profound, involving the rise of the opposition involving the rise of the opposition to power as governors, senators, city mayors, and municipal presidents. It also brought with it <coughs> growing freedom of, of expression and information, and in short, a transition from an authoritarian political system to a modern <coughs> democratic one. In, in economic terms, it meant shifting from a closed economy with marked state involvement 
from appreciably free one due above all to the signing of the North American Free Trade Agreement with the United States and Canada. A country's political history can be related and explained in a variety of ways. One is to recount its most acute conflicts, but that would only lead to a catastrophist vision. Another is to analyze the evolution of its institution, but that would just produce a notion of continuity. Perhaps the ideal perspective would be to take advantage of both of these span standpoints. So, we should acknowledge that those years of economic modernization and democratization in the late 20th century were also ones in which we witnessed a resurgence of political violence, including a guerrilla movement in southeastern Mexico, which we might consider to be extemporaneous when compared chronologically with the other Latin American guerrilla movements. Yet, undoubtedly, undoubtedly that movement succeeded in reminding us of the existence of two Mexicos, mestizo and indigenous, modern and traditional, developed and barbaric. The new century. Although the 20th century did not commence in my country in the year 1900, but rather 10 years later, with the outbreak of the Mexican Revolution, we can state that the year 2000 did mark both the historical conclusion and the end according to the calendar of the 20th century. Still another major historical change occurred that year. The political party that had kept the presidency for 70 years was defeated by the party that appeared to have, that appeared to have been constructed 60 years prior only to serve as opposition. The man who achieved that change was an entrepreneur not, associ not associated with the government apparatus. That very fact gave him his strength in the election and at the same time his weakness in government. Mexicans voted for him precisely because he was uninvolved in politics. Nevertheless, his background as a businessman convinced him of the ineffectiveness of the government and the evil nature of politics. That was why he was a great candidate for a, for a ruler with many shortcomings. Thus, the so-called transition was, re, was reduced to party alternation. Today, the country regrets how few improvements were brought by his term. And as if that weren't enough, Mexico is now facing a severe economic crisis and an open war on drug cartels headed by a government that was seriously questioned due to the electoral process in which it triumphed in the year 2006. Mexico's current government is up against so many different problems that it has been forecast in all spheres and media that party alternation may well be reversed in the next elections to be held in 2012. Our true challenge is to see to it that the transition to democracy is irreversible. Mexico's history throughout the 20th century cannot conceal several major conflicts. However, with an appropriate viewpoint, it is clear that the solutions were greater than the challenge they were intended to meet. Unlike journalists, journalists who are always uncovering immediate threats and unlike philosophers, who are eternally heralding inevitable catastrophes, we, historians, can be optimistic. I repeat, our history has been a series of challenges overcome, and it will, and it will, and it will continue to be so, in spite of the facts, of the recent facts, my trust is in Mexico. Thank you.